Hi, I'm Amanda Jane Woodall and welcome to my fashion school. So, post-war Britain is often seen as the most optimistic time to be a teenager in Britain. So why did this lead to the fights between the mods and rockers? Let's take a look at who we're dealing with. In 1960, conscription ended, which meant that young men didn't have to submit to the authority of the military. Many working class children were excited to leave school at the age of 15 because they felt like they had been failed by the education system as they had to deal with inexperienced young teaching staff and very large class sizes. However, low paid work was readily available to school leavers and it had been invested into apprenticeship schemes which meant that the young men and women could actually earn more than the previous generation. For the first time, teenagers actually had their own disposable income and this was very frightening for their parents and the authorities because for the first time they had lost control of a generation. The old standards for young people had been to just copy your parents but this new generation used their spending power to satisfy a compulsive desire to stand out from the crowd. Image, identity and belonging became very important to people and so there came the birth of subcultures especially focused in the southern area of the country. The Teddy Boys had been the first subculture to emerge in Britain and they liked to dress differently, they went to clubs in groups and they were known for carrying offensive weapons like razors. An evolution of this group came alive in the 60s and they were named the Rockers and this name is often thought to be related to their love of rock and roll but actually the most important thing in the rocker lifestyle was British motorcycles and Rockers was actually a mechanical name coming from the rocker box that worked the valves of the motorcycle engine. And this culture was very beneficial to the motorcycle industry in Britain, who was actually threatened at that time by the introduction of a small, affordable family car. They favoured aerial and triumph bikes, and they would make their own moderations to them to make them appear louder and faster. This masculine group, sometimes accompanied by like-minded girlfriends, lived to reach 100 miles per hour on the open road. They loved the idea of speed and living dangerously. And actually the police detested this group of young people because they were very reckless and they had a lack of respect for authority but actually there was not a lot they could do because there wasn't speed limits enforced outside urban areas in those days so there was very little consequences for the rockers. They were seen as the outcasts of Britain and would band together in roadside cafes and alongside bridges. And you could easily identify a rocker not just by their motorcycle but also by their uniform. They were very inspired by 50s movie star Marlon Brando and also the practical elements of motorcycle riding. Of course, the most desirable part of this uniform was the Lancer leather jacket and everybody wanted to get one from Lewis Levers who introduced the Bronx jacket which was a recreation of a flying jacket. These jackets were very carefully designed with the rockers in mind because they featured things like 
plastic buckles which meant that riders wouldn't scratch their gas tanks and they were a close fit so that the jackets wouldn't balloon whilst they were riding. They wore protective trousers like jeans with big turn-ups, they wore leather gloves and they wore white silk scarves around their mouths. They wore heavyweight long line hobnail boots for endurance and they also wore perfectly white socks turned over the top of their boots and it is rumoured that you would be sent home from meetups if this strip of fabric was not clean you'd be told to go home and get a wash. Customization was also added to their jackets in the form of pin badges, patches and studs. But actually the studs weren't that practical because if you had a fall from your bike, they would leave little burn marks in your skin. And also sometimes the overcrowding of metal badges would cause the jackets to become very heavy. And rockers from different areas of the country, they would make themselves stand out as a group by embellishing their jackets with their own unique symbol, such as the Nottingham Aces who had an ace on the back of their jacket, but they soon realised that this probably wasn't a good idea because it made them instantly recognisable to the police. Polite society viewed the rockers as intimidating, mean and nasty and the two groups would just completely avoid each other. The rockers embraced the nostalgia of the 50s and they wanted to preserve these traditions but there was actually an opposing culture that was forming that embraced modernism and wanted a new version of the working class identity. So the modernists or mods, they wanted to appear elegant, polished and upwardly mobile. They were sick of the association with the working class and dirty jobs and factory work and so they used their spending power to appear more sophisticated. The subculture prided itself on cleanliness and it took the idea of wearing a Sunday best but to the everyday and this was a brand new concept for men who had never had the freedom to make decisions about their style before. Shopping had become a huge part of their culture and they were very particular about the details fabrics, cuts and colours that they chose for their outfits. They favoured the continental style which was known for being very crisp and clean. The mods are associated with the scooter boys and they all wanted to purchase Italian scooters with brands like Vespa and Lambretta being the most desirable. And unlike the rockers, the mods they chose style over speed and they didn't always have very much mechanical knowledge of their scooters. So they would adorn it with flashy things like copious amounts of lights, wheel trims and mirrors and this was in hope that it would attract a girlfriend. They were the ultimate peacocks posers and they lived for the dance halls, music and dating. A new sound of rhythm and blues accompanied the rise of mod subculture and they would play American music in disused ballrooms holding unlicensed events for mod teenagers. By 1963, this musical genre had reached the mainstream and they could watch their favourites like Georgie Fame on the TV series Ready Steady Go. The dance hall culture encouraged people to use amphetamines, which meant that the young men could stay alert and dance till the early hours of the morning. Purple Hearts and Black Bombers had been used frequently in society for things like 
weight loss and for trauma in the military and this meant that they were too easily available for young people and they were only illegal if they had actually been stolen from somewhere like a chemist. The mod girls would dance together in groups and they were seen as the less wild counterparts to the mod men who were part of the underground culture of places like London where violence was just a normal part of everyday life. The mods wore tailored suits that were a complete change from the generation of suits that came before them. Theirs were inspired by the French, the Italians and European cinema and magazines. You see the old suits had been very grey, they were stale and they looked like giant sacks but these new suits were very clean, crisp and sharp. They had small lapels and small pockets and were worn with a very thin tie. They also favoured geometric shapes, very smart collared knitwear, funnel necks and polo necks and also things like suede coats and blazers. They wore their hair very neatly, sometimes in a side parting and they also favoured hats like pork pie, trilby and fedoras. A bowling style shoe became a desirable part of the aesthetic and bowling alleys around the country saw an increase in the theft of their loan shoes. And they also very famously brought to prominence the Parker jacket, which was an oversized khaki jacket with a hood that would cover their elegant clothing and protect it from our lovely British weather. <laughs> so, both mods and rockers were a very visible reaction to the freedoms of the time. However, in the early 60s, the mods were kind of talked about favourably by the media, whereas the rockers were seen as the rebels and the anti-establishment. The obvious differences between the subcultures left to teasing and mockery between the two sides. However, this rivalry would be absolutely escalated beyond proportion by the media during the summer season of 1964. So it's a British tradition for working class families in cities like London to visit the seaside and get some escapism from the city. So they would be entertained in places like the amusements and they would have affordable meals in the cafes and restaurants and it was just something that most families would do. Following on from these traditions, teenagers in large groups would meet up on bank holidays at resorts like Clacton and Brighton and Hastings, which meant that on the 29th of March 1964, unusually the mods and the rockers all ended up congregated at Clacton and this would cause outrage in the headlines of the following day. And listening to different accounts of what actually happened this day, there is a variety of stories that kind of also vary in their severity. But what we do know is that it was the coldest season in Clacton since 1884. Uh, everything was closed, so there was absolutely nothing to do. And a lot of the teenagers had been refused from entering establishments. So they were very bored and a lot of kind of fighting broke out and they also stormed the pier and caused some vandalism it was uncharacteristic to have this kind of a clash going on in a small seaside resort and so the police were called and they made some arrests. 
However, the media coverage really exaggerated this rivalry between the mods and the rockers. And this incited absolute hatred between the two opposite groups and meant that this kind of inflamed the situation everybody wanted to be at the next meetup to defend their identities, their groups and their friends. It evoked a sense of working class tribalism and a kind of fight for territory which meant that all across the country at these resorts there was violent clashes. These fights included one famously documented in Brighton in May of 1964 where actually rockers were thrown off the embankments and people were fighting with makeshift weapons and pebbles from the beaches and this actually became quite frightening for people who were there just trying to enjoy their holidays. The police had to take kind of very tough action and they arrested a absolute mass of young people. And seeing the subculture torn apart by the media left many of the original mods feeling disillusioned with the culture because they just loved the style and the image and the fun and they weren't so much into completely wrecking their futures. And the rockers, although many kind of maintained their bikes, they actually couldn't live a very dangerous and fast paced life once they were settled, married and had children. So the very realistic and boring reason for the death of the mods and rockers is that they grew up and just moved on with their life to new things. But the culture and the style is still idolised to this day, being referenced by many modern artists, musicians and designers as this period in the 60s is widely still seen as the most exciting time to have been a British teenager. So we have come to the end of this video but I will see you again in my follow-up video where I'm going to talk to you about more British icons. The mod girls would dance together. Oh no. Sorry.